Hi Year 12s, uh, so we're going to look at the second video in the evolution uh, topic now and this is going to be unit 4.2 in your textbook which is all about reproductive isolation mechanisms uh, in this subtopic. So uh, let's get started. So first off we have to be able to define what a species is. Um, and the best definition here is that first one we've got there. Uh, a species can be defined as a group of organisms that actually or potentially could interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Now, the key there is have to produce fertile offspring. So that offspring itself can go on and reproduce when it gets to the age of sexual maturity. Um, so, for example, if we, if two humans have children, that child can potentially have more children. It can reproduce. Whereas if a horse and a donkey reproduce, you get a mule. That mule is physically impossible of reproducing itself when it reaches sexual maturity. It just it doesn't work. So therefore, we know that the horse and donkey must be two different species. So a species must be able to produce offspring that can produce further offspring. That's how we define a species. That's not the only way possible to define a species because obviously there are species that don't quite fit that definition. So for example, uh, many invertebrae and bacteria go through reproduction either asexually or they self-fertilize themselves. Um, because of that, we can also define species based on morphology, biochemistry and genetic composition. And so for example, I mean just further into that, if a mule can't reproduce, then it can't reproduce offspring that can reproduce. Therefore, technically, the mule doesn't fit under that species category, so a mule can't be a species. But we know the mule is a species. So there must be other ways for defining a species. Um, so, for example, morphology. So we classify species based on the similarities in their shape and their anatomy. So we know all mules have a very similar shape, and their anatomy is the same. As each other. Bacteria, we classify bacteria based on their shape. We've looked about that in year 11. Uh, biochemistry, um, so we can also uh, organize species based on their biochemistry, um, which is basically we're just grouping animals based on the similarities of their chemical composition, which makes up their cells, their tissues, as well as the similarities between any metabolic processes that are going to occur in those cells. Uh, and genetic composition is another one where we basically classify species based on the similarities in their DNA nucleotide sequence. And we do that by genoming the entire species and looking at their genome and finding similarities and differences. If there's lots of similarities, we can probably say they're closely related and possibly the same species. Out of all of those ways, the most accurate way of, and truthfully even combining being able to reproduce and produce offspring, the most accurate way of being able to define a species and find out these two animals are of the same species is by comparing DNA nucleotide sequences as well as the amino acid sequences of the protein molecules between two different organisms and that will help us determine if something is the same species. But sometimes members of a species that reproduce sexually don't produce fertile offspring with members of another species. So it's just physically impossible for them to create offspring that are, not, that are fertile. Um, and now we say that these species are reproductively isolated from members of different species. So that's great to say that, but what is reproductive isolation? Reproductive isolation is just the mechanisms that prevent mechanisms that prevent members of two different species from mating and producing fertile offspring. Um, it helps to maintain the integrity of a species over a lifetime. I pop. Are you finished? Um, so it helps to maintain the integrity of the species over time and we have different forms of reproductive isolation and we group them according to how they prevent those species from producing fertile offspring. So let's have a look at the different processes we've got now. Uh, so we've got two different types of isolation mechanisms. We've got prezygotic and we've got postzygotic isolation mechanisms. Um, prezygotic mechanisms are ones that prevent fertilization from occurring between members of different species and it prevents the formation of a viable zygote. So it prevents the zygote from ever being created. Uh, that we'll talk about postzygotic in the next slide, but 
let's just focus on prezygotic for the time being. So there is five different prezygotic isolation mechanisms. So we've got ecological isolation, temporal isolation, mechanical isolation, behavioral isolation, and gametic or gametic isolation. So first one, ecological isolation. Very straightforward. The two species occupy different habitats or niches within that geological area. So they can't share, well, they can't breed because they don't share a habitat or a breeding ground. They can't physically get together to breed. And we'll look at an example of that in a second. Uh, temporal isolation, temporal meaning time. So while the species are in the same habitats, they're going to be sexually mature at different times of the year. So wanting to reproduce at different times of the year, therefore, because they're wanting to create offspring at different times of the year, they never actually meet up to create offspring. Uh, mechanical isolation. Again, straightforward based on the name. The species have different shaped genitalia, which means they don't relate with each other and therefore they can't physically mate together. It's physically impossible to mate together. Um, so think of like dolphins and fish. It's, they may contain the same um, habitat, but it's physically impossible for a dolphin to mate with a fish. It's just, there's mechanical isolation there. Um, behavioral isolation, so they might have different species specific courtship patterns. Um, the example I always use of this is there are, you, you've everyone's seen a pigeon and a pigeon does that weird mating dance where it fluffs all its tail feathers up and it does a little dance. That mating dance or the courtship ritual is only going to work on other pigeons, not even all the time on those other pigeons. If a pigeon tries to do that mating ritual with a magpie, the magpie is completely and utterly uninterested. It doesn't work. So it just doesn't impress the members of the different species. So that's a behavioral isolation. And we'll look at that in an example in a second too as well. And finally, gametic isolation. They just produce gametes that are incompatible with different species. So basically the sperm can never fertilize the egg. They're just incompatible. Um, so let's have a quick look at some of those examples. So we've got geographic or ecological isolation. We've got one little fox here, another fox separated by the river they can't get across. So they physically can't breed. Uh, we have temporal isolation. So we've got one flower here that's ready to pollinate now. And the other one's not actually ready to pollinate. It's not sexually mature yet. So they, they're physically, these two cannot physically reproduce at this time. Uh, mechanical isolation, so two different species, two different shaped genitals, therefore can't mate. Um, behavioral isolation, so we have this orange bird over here who is completely and utterly unimpressed by the bluebird's song. So this song is, this is their mating song, it's not working at all, it's not impressing the different species. So there's just some examples of prezygotic techniques. Uh, Postzygotic. Now, yeah, well, so we're going to look at postzygotic. Um, unfortunately, prezygotic mechanisms don't always prevent two different species from mating. Therefore, sometimes two different species will produce an offspring. So the mule. So the mule has to go through postzygotic isolation. Um, postzygotic mechanisms prevent that offspring, which we call the offspring of two different species, a hybrid. It prevents that offspring from passing on its genes. There's two different types, there's hybrid unviability and there's hybrid sterility. Hybrid unviability is when the offspring is formed, but it's unhealthy and therefore it's most likely going to die before it can produce its own offspring. It's just not going to live long enough to produce offspring. And then we have hybrid sterility, which is what the mule has. And so the hybrid offspring survives long enough, it reaches sexual maturity, but it's sterile. It can never, the meiosis will never occur correctly because there's difference in chromosome number and structure. Therefore, homologous pairing never takes place. Meiosis never takes place. Therefore, it can never produce offspring because it doesn't produce gametes. So like I said, mule is the perfect example of this. So the offspring of a female horse and a male donkey is called a mule. Why doesn't that work? Well, a horse has 64 chromosomes, a donkey has 62. So this doesn't work. That means the mule is going to get 32 chromosomes from its mother and 31 chromosomes from its father. So now it's got 63 chromosomes. How can homologous pairing work with 63 chromosomes? Therefore, it can't produce gametes, makes it sterile. 